The following is a Goulash Media production. Goulashmedia.net. Welcome to the system is down. Hello, hello, hello. What is up, downers? Welcome back to another great episode of the least comfortable, least PC, and I'd say most interesting podcast on the web. The system is down, and thank you guys so much for faithfully tuning in every single Monday for your weekly dose of discomfort. Uh, Today's episode is the conclusion of our series on Waco. Last week's episode was my conversation with Gary Nesner, who was the FBI negotiator on the case, so if you missed that, you definitely need to go check that out. Um, You can find it at tsidpod.com. Uh, on today's episode, I had the absolute pleasure of getting the other side of the story from Branch Davidian and one of the few Waco survivors, David Thibodeau, and it was a fantastic conversation, so I really want to get into it as quickly as possible, but before we do, and on a completely unrelated side note, uh, I want to let you guys know about a contest that we have going on. It is a drawing for a free giveaway of the new Star Wars movie, The Last Jedi, on DVD, and uh, you can enter to win that all this week. If you want the details on how you can win a copy of the movie, um, I'll, I'll give all the information at the end of the show, so stick around for that. Or you can find more information on our forum by going to tsidpod.com forward slash forum and find out how you can win a copy of The Last Jedi. Anyway, much, much, much more importantly, David Thibodeau. I, I was super stoked, beyond stoked, to be able to get him on the show. He's a great guy. And I really wanted his side of the story. I mean, we're it's 25 years ago today. He was like right in the middle of this mess and knowing that any day he could get potentially shot and killed, essentially for his beliefs. Um, thankfully, that didn't happen. He made it out, and I'm honored to be able to help share his story. Now, there were some minor technical issues when we were recording this. Uh, David was only able to talk by phone, so the audio quality is... A little shaky in some spots. I cleaned it up as best as I could, but there's there's a couple, eh, a couple weird spots. <laughs> but it's definitely listenable. And uh, also, David was in a bit of a time crunch, so at some point in the conversation, I just shut up and let him talk, let him tell his story uh, for as long as he was willing to. Uh, because on it, let, let's be honest here. I mean, nobody's here, including myself. Nobody's here to listen to what I have to say about this. So. Uh, it's a little shaky and we had to wrap up pretty suddenly at the end, but there was no way I was going to not put out this conversation because I think it's extremely important. So all that said, and without further ado, here is my conversation with David Thibodeau. My guest today is author and Waco survivor, David Thibodeau. David, how are you doing today? Good, how are you, man? It's great to be here. Thanks uh, for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, now, after you know your recent miniseries came out, would I, should I also include Hollywood actor in your uh, your credentials there? I don't know if I go that far. <laughs> I mean, I just sat on the chair and read a paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, you, kind of neat, you, you nailed the part. Character. Thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. I was, that. I was hoping to give you a, a speaking line, but you know, whatever. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, my as I told you over email, we've done on this show, we've done two hour uh, just chats about the Waco incident and all that. Um, and I also had Gary Nesner on. By the time this comes out, it will be last week. So uh, my listeners have heard, you know, my uneducated take on the story. Uh, and when this airs, they will have heard Gary's side of the story from the FBI's perspective. But I can say with sure. complete confidence that, you know, the most interesting and valuable side is the one from inside Mount Carmel. So, David... Just uh, start from the top. Tell me everything. <laughs> well, uh, boy, yeah, that's quite a way to start it, man. <laughs> well, how'd you come uh, to meet David? It'll start with the meeting. Yeah, I guess that's where we'd have to go. Sorry. I met David, actually, a bit different than the series. They, they didn't have time to have a California connection in there. But I yeah. met David in, in Sun, on Sunset Strip at the Guitar Center there. And he and Steve Schneider were looking at a drum set, an electronic drum set. I had gone in to buy sticks because my singer had broken my sticks for our practice on, on the dashboard of the car. I made him stop. <laughs> uh, 
fate would have it. I made him stop, and I went in to get some sticks and happened to go in the electronics room briefly, and they asked me if I would – these two guys asked me if I would sit down and play the, the kit there. And so I did, and they liked they heard, I guess. They gave me their card, and they said, you know, we're looking for a drummer. Um, I looked at the card, and the card had, had like, uh, Cyrus Productions and had all this religious scripture on the back. And I was like, wow, uh, you guys Christian? And I handed the card back. Mm -hmm. I, just, I wasn't really looking to be in a, in a Christian band or any kind of like religious thing at all. You know, mm -hmm. especially living, coming from Maine and moving to California. You're super wary of that stuff. Right. And, and you know, this was before Scientology. It was really known what Scientology was, you know. Sure. So, I don't know. I guess it was just, uh, I still, I, I wasn't interested to make a long story short, but I took the card. So, and, so know, the breaking of a drumstick in the car was what led you down this strange yeah, turn of events. And, <laughs> but, you know, even the funnier thing is just about a week before that happened, maybe a little less, I was uh, working at Men's Chinese Theater in the gift shop, and I had this ridiculous red smock that they made you wear, you know, like some corporations do it, that you have to wear certain clothes. Mm -hmm. It was that was a total dead end job. And I was looking up to uh, I was looking up to the sky one day, and I just said, God, whoever you have whoever you have sent me to L.A. to meet, because I knew that I was I went to L.A. for a reason mm -hmm. to meet. Somebody. And I thought it was going to be the you know like the next Led Zeppelin, but of course it didn't really work out that way. Not but, quite. <laughs> um, and I knew I had to meet someone, some people. And I said, God, whoever you have sent me here to meet, please make this happen now. It's the, you know, you know, I've been there for two years at this point. Mm -hmm. And so then literally three, it was three days to a week later, I went to that guitar center and met David and Steve. So it was kind of interesting. But I didn't think much about the religious thing. Um, I like the way they described it. They basically said, you know, Steve said, you know, I used to teach comparative religions in, in Hawaii, and this is, uh, this David Koresh person here, this, he's the guitarist, I'm, I'm the manager. Mm -hmm. He goes, I met this guy, me and him have been all over the world. We talked to rabbis, we talked to priests, we talked to everyone um, that has an interest in the scripture. And we just want to know what it really means, what it really says. And this guy has a, 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 some really great insight as to what it really says, what it really means. Mm -hmm. And the way he explained it was very interesting to me because it wasn't like if they would have been preaching or said just believe in Jesus or, you know, and anything like that, I would have been done. But the way they said that it made it sound like they took it as a study and they took it seriously. And they, when they spoke to different people um, about the scripture, it just, he conveyed in his voice a sense of even more than urgency, a, a sense of, of intellect that I sure. thought was very interesting. And that's, that's really what got me interested. That's why I called a few days later um, because, you know, I was looking around, I was kind of in a dead end job and, you know, my band members weren't, really that we weren't really that serious at the time we were goofing off it's just I, I wanted you know i wanted something a little more than what i was than what i had, was creating for myself right so you know uh, steve came over and he gave a couple studies he came over one night my roommates i told my roommates i had the guy coming over for, for, we're gonna have a bible study and my roommates couldn't <laughs> they couldn't grab their their, their coats and hats fast enough to hell out the apartment it was right. hysterical and, you know, then there's a knock on the door as they're leaving. And then these two guys, it was Steve and it was uh, Jamie Casillo was there with Steve. And they had <laughs> they had a bag full of beer. They brought like a couple 12 packs. And they said, oh, we have a couple of beers. You guys, you know, you're welcome to stay. We're going to talk about the scripture. And to my surprise, my roommate stayed for the beer. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just weird. You know, we had we had like an interesting study about the kingdom to be set up. Yeah. And the thing that really impressed me the most was when Steve Schneider opened his Bible, he had this half-inch margin Bible, or one-inch margin Bible, where mm -hmm. you could basically take notes on the side of every page. Mm -hmm. And his Bible, every single page, was filled from the top to the bottom with notes, and it was all color-coded. So basically, every single page looked like, they looked like they had torn apart the scripture and dissected it in a way that I didn't think would be human as possible. Right. I was, there, I was impressed with that alone. And then, you know, the study was, I thought it was pretty good, especially considering how I was never really a big Bible guy. Um, I, I won't, I wasn't, I definitely wasn't 
um, I wasn't joining up at that point, you know, it's kind of an introduction. Mm-hmm. You know, and a few days later, I guess I went out to Pomona where David Crush was staying. And, uh, we had a jam, you know, he had a, a drum set there. And, uh, we played for a little while. It was pretty cool. I thought he was kind of a progressive style guitarist. Um, didn't do a lot of songs. It was just kind of he jam and I play along to it. And uh, that went on for a couple months. And then what happened was there was something called the Feast of Tabernacles was coming. And Koresh and the people at Mount Carmel kept the feast days of the scripture. So they didn't do Sunday, for example. Uh, they did Sabbath. Uh, so it would be Friday night to Saturday night. Sure. Uh, it was kind of like the day of rest, the high holy day, if you will. Um, they did the Feast of Atonement, Passover, and, and Atonement, uh, the two-week holidays of the Scripture. And literally said what would happen is he said, I'm going to, to Texas. We've got this place out in Waco, outside of Waco. It's an axle. They said, we're going out there, and uh, it's, you know, it's this big festival season of the Scripture. We have people from all over the world coming to learn the seven seals from me. And he said, you know, there'll be people from Australia, there'll be people from England, uh, people from uh, New Zealand, and just all over the world are going to be coming in. So right now there's about 30 or 40 people there. But by the mm-hmm. time everyone gets in, it'll be about 200 or so. Mm-hmm. And he asked me if I wanted to go, and I said, you know, I thought about it. I said, why not? It sounds like kind of an adventure. Right. So I ended up going with him, and it was an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> when I got there, you know, it was just this place that had like a church and a cafeteria and about 10 little houses all in a row that it was in the middle of nowhere, total flat plate. Mm-hmm. What I call the ant hill, because there's so many fire ants on that property is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just looking at it going, Oh my God, I went from Los Angeles to this. This is <laughs> insane. Right. I, it, it, the culture shock was phenomenal, but whatever, you know, I was there for a reason. I started talking to some people. It was really funny. One of the very, I was there about a week before people started to show up. A couple of days before people started to show up. Uh, you know, I don't know time, three or four days, whatever, somewhere in there. But I remember one of the first studies David gave me. <laughs> he, uh, it was uh, there was it, the clouds were starting to roll in, and mm-hmm. people, you know, are shutting the door, and some of the older people come to the cafeteria with their Bible. David starts talking. And he starts giving this scripture about the kingdom be set up and he has this you know he like holds his hand up and he makes this really loud point and as soon as he does there's a there's a thunderclap <laughs> and the thunder's <laughs> so loud that it rattles the windows and nice. i just remember does this happen all the time to you when you're giving studies and he's just <laughs> smiling you know some of the old people are smiling <laughs> <laughs> this is very surreal right. um it, it was an interesting study well, anyway after that study and you know, i'm not gonna get into the details of the study we, we would run out of time but people did start coming in from various countries you know the henry family would come in you know and it'd be like these uh uh you know uh, then, then these different families you know people from new zealand people from hawaii people from literally all over it was amazing mm-hmm. a lot of english people came in and um you know i started to meet some people and so not like just you know, you know crazy castaways from society who are seeking not out. At all. Yeah, these are normal intellectual people that were listening to this man. Well, not only that, these were all people. What David did is he targeted the, the religious schools of the, these countries. So he would go to a campus of you know say you know a, a, a seminary school. And he would talk to some of the kids there that were studying about the scripture. And they were blown away with what he offered, what he would show them literally in a half hour. They would say to him after, I learned more from you in this half hour than I've learned my two years going here to the school and paying them all this money. Wow. And literally everybody told me that. Everyone that came from a school, someone from New Zealand, someone from England, someone from Australia, they all told me the same thing. They learned more from David in 10, 15 minutes than they did their years of study. Mm-hmm. at these schools and they said why am i going to the school they left their school and they ended up coming and learning from david is what ended up happening now, how did word get around about this back in that time before the internet what it is today <laughs> when you go to a school like that <laughs> you start showing the kid and then the kids stop coming to class word gets around very very quick <laughs> yeah and so of course the leaders of the school would call him an apostate and you know it's heresy 
the same stuff it says in the Bible about what Christ went through, basically. Mm-hmm. They would get all upset. And, you know, David's challenge was easy. It was out of the, the out of Revelation, mm-hmm. where it says, um, who is worthy, God says, to take this book out of my right hand. I have a book in my hand sealed with seven seals. And who is worthy to loose the seals thereof and reveal what the seals mean? And it says in Revelation, no man was worthy that was dead or alive or found dead under the earth. No man had ever been worthy to open the seals. And then there's a lamb in the midst, and he comes up to God and takes the book out of God's hand. So mm-hmm. it's the Messiah, the, the the lamb, who is worthy to reveal the seven seals. And David would simply say, can you guys show me what these seals are? You are running this university. You, you know, you're making all this money off this book. What does it mean? Show me the seven seals. And they would be like, well, we don't really know what that means. It's all <laughs> theory. And and then he would simply say, well, well, why don't you let me show you what they are and where they are? <laughs> and of course, if you're in a position where you're making money off it, all you can do is yell and say that is that is heresy. Right. What are you saying to the lamb? Yeah, and they would get so upset and they would just yell and try to get all their kids to come back to school. And a lot of them would leave and come with David because they would listen to what he had to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, if you took up on the challenge, you pretty much had your mind blown. I mean, it was it was quite it was quite a quite a quite a study he could give you. He could really show you what things meant in there and how it all tied together. Yeah. So so did you buy into it? Like, did you believe everything up? <laughs> like, did you believe that he was the Messiah and all that stuff? <laughs> I like that buy into it. That's really funny. That's good. <laughs> what happened to me is over the course of a long, long time, maybe six, seven, eight months. What really happened was during that first two week period, uh, David got on the stage. I think it was the first night and he had, he had a Bible in his hand. He said, some people see this thing, this book here is two pieces of cow leather with a bunch of pages in between. And they spend their lives trying to figure it out. And he said, when I see the scripture and he holds, he held the Bible up to his forehead. And he said, when I look at this book, I see it panoramically from Genesis to Revelation as if it is happening before me right now. And I said to myself, that's a pretty tall tale to be telling. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's, that's a pretty arrogant statement. I'm thinking to myself, you know, I shut up and let it go. I mean, I was in a group of people. He was given the study. Let's see what he has to say. And, you know, he would go into the first seal and be like, you go from Psalms 1 to Psalms 150, tie it all together, show you how it's a part of a plan. And then he would go to Ezekiel and some of the other scriptures, Jeremiah. And he would just literally just dance through the scripture and show you a way of looking at it you never you may have never seen before. Mm-hmm. But it didn't seem like it was an interpretation. You would read the words exactly what it said. And for the first time, you're seeing exactly what it says and you're understanding the meaning of what it means. And I, it was just very intense. It's, it's hard to describe to people. But over the course, after that two weeks was up, uh, and he had covered the first three or four seals pretty much in depth. I was, I was convinced that he, he had something. I think most of us, we just looked at him. He was very much a person. I mean, he didn't like give a study and then go away and you didn't see him until the next study. Mm-hmm. And there was no mystery. If you were out there working on one of the old buildings, he'd be out there working on the building with you. Yeah. You know, he was very much on hand. So there was no mystery about it. I mean, he was basically a Texas redneck kind of good old boy, <laughs> which I've always kind of had a problem with, you know, that kind of type. Yeah. But, but he wasn't in the sense, you know, there was no racism in him. That I could tell, it was nothing like that. He, you know, it's just like he was handy with fixing motors, and you know, he could do things. He was a carpenter. Uh, he had spent all his life as doing sheet sheet work and all this, and he could build houses. He's just like a normal guy that was given this gift. And what's right. really interesting is if you talk to the older people that lived in Mount Carmel, they all there was two or three prophets that lived out there. What they all say were prophets. There was Lois Roden, there was uh, Brother Howdeth, it went way, way back. And they all talked to one that would come and reveal the seven seals. Mm-hmm. And that's what's very interesting. Then Vernon comes on, and he starts teaching the Bible in a much deeper way than most people were used to. 
And then what happens, he went to Israel. When he came back from Israel is when he really got the seven seal, where he was able to reveal the seven seals. And he hadn't talked about the seven seals that much before that, which was really interesting. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, he's teaching it. So it seems like when he went to Israel, he was given something. That's, that's how all the people around him, and that was before my time, but that's how everyone describes it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's, that's a very powerful testimony when you're, when you're talking to people who have witnessed this. And then you see someone that's now revealing the seven seals, and it's just like, it's, it's masterful. So, right. you know, uh, buying into it, that's interesting. I, I, I didn't like, mean that disrespectfully. I mean... <laughs> no, I understand. I, I appreciate it. I, no, I appreciate it, actually, because that's the way I would look at it if it were any other group in the world and I was on the outside. Sure. In other words, in other words, when you hear a news story where some kid dies because his parents won't take him to the hospital because he's sick and they think that God's going to save him because it says in the scripture, if you believe God will save your kid, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff drives me insane. <laughs> right? So I, I'm, I'm very skeptical on the same way. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah. How can you buy into the Bible where you let your kid die because you believe that God's going to save them? Right. See, that kind of so, like you know, most I think normal thinking individual that kind of stuff drives me absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's the guy that comes, and literally he can reveal the whole book and tie it together. It was just it was a fascinating. It was fascinating. It was a, it was believable in the sense that it was so deep that most of the time it would be above most people's heads. Right. But you knew you were witnessing something really and deep and incredible, and you wanted to know more. So the more you learn, the more you wanted to know. So that's why I talk about conviction. I came to the point, the point where I was convicted. I believe that, yes, this is a message from a higher source, and, and I need to listen to this. Yeah, it's blowing I my mean, mind. When, when everything starts adding up, it's hard to deny it. It's, it when, when you're that deep yeah. into it, it's hard to not see the things coming together. Once you're convicted, you can't really walk away and live with yourself, you know? Yeah. That's the thing. And that could go that that could go with someone who's in the military and is very highly patriotic and wants to go serve his country and then he gets to, you know, Iraq or Afghanistan and he learns that wow, this isn't really what they this isn't the story they told me going right. into it. But what do you just quit? No, I mean, you know, you're <laughs> you can't, you're there. <laughs> you know, it's like kill or die and right. uh, once you put in that situation, you're gonna do what you gotta do to survive. Yeah. So let's get into the incident. Um, so uh, trucks roll up. Did you, uh, was there warning of this? Did you know it was coming? Like some people say, uh, were you guys tipped sure, off? You're, you're talking about February 28th. What happened mm-hmm. was a few weeks before that, these couple guys move in across the street, three guys, and they have, oh, nice SUVs, and they got staring guys, these sunglasses, and they get, they're, instead of moving in furniture, they're moving in electronic equipment. And then when we finally meet them and talk to them, you know, they say that they're uh, ranchers. One of them is a rancher, and I guess one's going to TSDC, which is a community college, a technical college. Mm-hmm. And they're, so, yeah, they're ranchers and they're students, and it just didn't <laughs> really make any sense at all, I mean, at all. So, obviously, we didn't really believe that, but whatever, it didn't matter. David did never... I mean, I think he realized that these people were from the government, yeah. but he he looked at Robert Rodriguez as just another person, another soul that he could help. Mm-hmm. And maybe he could, you know, show him the scripture and Robert would um, maybe if not embrace it, at least show the high, his higher ups that there was nothing illegal going on. And they should call this raid off. Yeah. So. Was there anything going on to your knowledge? Were, were there illegal guns, drugs, or pedophilia, like all the allegations? There was absolutely there was no drugs, that's for sure. <laughs> no, there was no drugs. Uh, you know, if you had, we would have beers once in a while, and it would be two or three. Mm-hmm. You know, it would be like the group doing it together. So uh, there was no alcoholism or, you know, nothing like that. Sure. Um, he had a lot of firearms. He did go to gun shows and he bought and he sold legally. He met a guy named Henry McMahon, who David, who Henry actually said that David was his preacher. Mm-hmm. So that occurred. And then Henry started showing him the, the ropes when it comes to, um, sorry, the, the ropes when it came to the, how, how the gun thing worked going to gun shows, mm-hmm. buying firearms and selling them. So, you know, there was, uh, one or two of the guys in the group started to go to the gun shows 
and uh, you know that that's it was like a form of of, of income, if you will. So yeah, that did occur. Mm-hmm. Um, it was nothing that was out of the ordinary when you live in Texas. Right. You know, I was not from a gun culture, but nonetheless, you know, being there, you find that you know you have people that when you're playing in town. In the band, you have other band members coming out and they were shooting at our firing range with us. And it just wasn't a big deal. It was just a Texas thing. Right. So I don't know. I guess it, it kind of grew on me. It never really bothered me. I, was, I don't know. It was, it was a constitutional business. It was fine. But sure. anyway, there were, you know, what ended up, I did notice early on that there was a bunch of kids and some, what seemed to be single women. I could never figure out what was going on there. Like who was married, who wasn't. No one really talked about it. Mm-hmm. Of course, later on, as you started, as they started, as they started to get into the seals more, we found that there was something called the House of David, and then a lot of the kids were Davids. Not all of them, but there was quite, quite a few that were, and with some of the the women that were there. Um, and this was he showed this in the scripture how this was supposed to be in the latter day. It would be this like really kind of weird thing that would happen, and folks would say uh, these are peculiar people, strange people. They live very differently than everyone else. Right. Here's this guy, he has all these women, he's got all these kids. So, you know, to me, it was like, I looked around at the women who were very, uh, I don't know, they were, they were amazing. They were just interesting to talk to. They were very mature. Mm-hmm. None of them seemed like they were kids to me is the thing. But anyway, you know, as you get to know them as people, you know, I don't know, they were just, they were just wonderful. They, the kids were great. Everyone worked together as a community. So some of the mothers would, you know, like, watch other people's children. Uh, they all worked in the, in the, you know, kitchen making food for everyone. I mean, it was just, they were just wonderful people. I don't know. It's, uh, it didn't seem weird. If it's the old, the thing that seemed weird to me. And I remember in my 23 year old head, I said, huh, if this guy can live together with all these women and they can do this without killing each other, then who am I to <laughs> say that this is wrong? Right. You know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like I'm non judgmental, and this is, you know, this is the way I do. I can't need to deal with one girlfriend. Drives me crazy. <laughs> God's got to be intervening somewhere here. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the way I looked at it. So it didn't bother me. I don't know. Maybe it should have. It just, it just really did. It's just that how it was. So mm-hmm. anyway, to make a long story short, uh, that's these are some of the reasons the government claimed that they needed to go in and, and take David down now. I never. I fired some semi-automatic weapons on the on the property or mm-hmm. in our firing range, but I never personally fired any full auto. So I don't even know if there were any there. All I know is during the congressional hearing, the government held up several firearms that had gone through a fire, and they looked like they'd gone through a fire, and mm-hmm. said this is a fully automatic weapon. Now, what they didn't do is show you how it was a fully automatic weapon. They never opened the, the thing up and said this is why. They right. just showed you a gun that looked like an assault rifle and said it was fully fully auto. There's one thing I have learned through all this is the government lies to you. The American people, the government has personally lied to me, uh, saying that they would give my mother a demo, a, a videotape showing that I'm okay and they never gave it to her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, Dan Smots here. I'm taking a second to interrupt myself talking to talk about myself because... You know, I don't get paid a penny for the hours and hours that I put into creating this show for you guys in your greedy little ears. And I've got a family to feed. To make that happen, I run my own media business called Goulash Media. If you have a need in anything from video production to graphic design to audio production and beyond, you can get it all for a painfully fair price at Goulash Media. In video, I do weddings, music videos, commercials, pageants, plays, etc., etc., etc. For design, I do photo editing, album art, logos, branding, business cards, merchandise, you name it. For audio, I do engineering engineering, production, editing, jingles, and, well, podcasts. So if you've got a media need of any kind, or if you'd just like to give a little something back and help keep my children fed, check out all the endless options at my website, goulashmedia.net. That's goulash, G-O-U-L-A-S-H, media.net, where we cater to the little guy with the big vision. (sighs) Okay. These people, it's just unreal. They lied about the front door. Uh, that's that's what I was going to bring up next. I mean, guns, of course, make it through the fire just fine because they're convenient for this case. But that door eh, didn't make it, right? Yeah, exactly. And that <laughs> was a metal door. There was two of them. One mm-hmm. was entered into evidence. But the important one, the one that was that David held in his right hand, that had a 
you know, evidence of all the bullet wounds, the bullet holes coming from the outside of the building into the building, that right. door disappeared during the trial in San Antonio. Right. Uh, it was, you know, obviously it's very, it was very a good thing for the ATF to have happened. That door was disintegrated in the fire, if you know what I'm saying. Right. So well, what just, significance you know, did that door have? Like, what would that have shown if it was brought into evidence? Sure. Well, everybody that was at the front door told me at different times the story of what happened at the front door. And they all said the same thing. They all said that David went to the door. He had it. He held the door in his right hand while he had his left hand out. And he was saying, hold on, stop. Mm -hmm. There's women and children in here. Let's talk about this. Don't fire. Let's talk about this. And then the, the, the door flew back in his hand from the velocity of a bullet hitting it. And that's when he slammed, slammed the door, and that's when Perry Jones, a 70-year-old unarmed man who was at the front door, uh, David's uh, father-in-law, went down from a bullet wound to his uh, stomach. Mm. So, you know, they killed Perry, basically, right there. And that's when some of the younger people, the younger guys started to fire back. When all this went down, did you personally witness these trucks coming up? Did you guys know that they were on their way there? I didn't. I was in the cafeteria area, but apparently mm. what had happened was, well, David was talking to Rodriguez Foyer, uh, David Jones, who was a uh, mailman and, and also was the brother to Rachel Jones and Michelle Jones, um, you know, Perry's son. He came in and said that, that the government was on their way, that he had talked to uh, someone from a news organization um, who was asking directions to Mount Carmel because something big was going down. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there was some warning there. I don't know exactly how, how long it was, maybe a half hour or so. I don't know the time, but I know that David, um, I was in the cafeteria area when he came down the steps, and he said, they're coming, they're on their way, don't anybody do anything stupid. And right. I could hear helicopters in the background. He said, don't anybody do don't anybody do anything stupid. We're going to try to talk to them and work it out. That's what we're about here at Mount Carmel. I'll mm -hmm. never forget him saying that. And so anyway, then he, he went down the hallway into the front door, and I heard him screaming and yelling, and then all of a sudden all hell broke loose. It just sounded like gunfire. It was just crazy. Right. Um, we, at the trials in San Antonio, some, some of the indications were that the gun, the first gunshots were fired at, the dogs that were in the pent up area fought in her five Alaskan Malamute pups. Mm -hmm. um, other testimony by, uh, by one of the ATF agents indicated that his, um, that his gun went off accidentally when he reached for it in his holster. And that could have been the first shot. Nobody really knows for sure. What mm -hmm. we do know is the lack of evidence. The fact that there's no uh, videotape of the early stages of the raid, which there should be. Right. Um, and the missing door, of course, really indicates that perhaps they're not as innocent as they are claiming. Mm -hmm. It definitely wasn't an ambush on the government. I mean, what's really funny, when you think about it, they come in, oh, the helicopters are firing into the building, too. We had, we had evidence of the, um, of a lot, there was a lot of holes in the roof, things like that. Of course, they claimed that the, <laughs> that the helicopters never fired. Right. Oh, it just went on the lies, man. It just went on and on. So but, um, that's one thing that confuses me. Are, are they actually claiming that the there's bullet holes that went from the ground up through multiple levels and then through the roof? Like that's more likely than somebody shooting down from above? I don't know what they're claiming, honestly. What I do know is that the attorneys came in and they saw the evidence. And you could tell clearly that the bullets were coming from the air down into the building. Mm -hmm. Very clearly, you could tell that. Sure. So, uh, any, yeah, I'm sorry, I got a little sidetracked. Um, so, for sure, you know, I mean, what I, uh, and, the, and the reason I bring this up is because they say, they make it sound like we went after them, like we went to their offices and shot at the ATF. That's right. what they make it sound like. They don't, you know, make it sound like they came in and raided a group of people, a bunch mm -hmm. of women and children living there, and they screwed it up so incredibly bad you know, that it's their fault. No, they make it sound in every step like it's entirely our fault right. for what occurred. And On your it, property. <laughs> yeah, we had, you know, and we, David had worked with the sheriff before and he had, he had said, if you guys have any 
problems. He said this to the ATF through Henry McMahon. If you have any mm-hmm. problems with any of the firearms, let us know. And you can come in and check any of the yellow sheets that you want. So I, you know, again, it's just, it's one thing after another. It never seems to end. <laughs> These people just, they came and they, they took over and then they pretended like they were the victims. And that's just what blows my mind. That kind of arrogance really is awesome. Mm-hmm. Trying to think if there's any anything else about the first day that we should talk about. I think that covers it. Sure. Well, we can we can jump around a little bit. It doesn't matter. Um, a question that I had for you was: uh, I, I've watched the series, and it's fantastic, by the way. In the series, it shows the interaction between your mom and David Crush's mom. Is that accurate? Were they speaking to each other and having that whole thing, or is that more just for the show? No, I think and that, that's pretty accurate. Um, really? They had to, they cut out a bunch of scenes though for time that I think were really poignant. Mm-hmm. And my mother and Bonnie actually gained a, they had a great friendship over the years, and they they became very very close. But at first, mom was very you know she was a little freaked down that this is David Koresh's mother, <laughs> and so you know there was kind of that first animosity toward her I think, and then they got to know each other a little bit. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, my mom was very close with Bonnie. Uh, it was uh, nice. she was very sad about everything that happened to Bonnie. Right. Really, that happened to Bonnie her whole life. Bonnie had a she worked really hard and she had a really crappy life. Very bad mm-hmm. men in her life. Uh, you know, poor decisions, that kind of thing, poverty. Mm-hmm. And that's where David came from. He came from that environment. You know, these abusive men. Um, uh, it's really unfortunate. She's a very strong woman. Yeah, she died recently too. Mm. Uh, it was very sad. Absolutely. So <clears throat> let's let's jump forward, jump into the siege and all that. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> Where do you start? Okay. Yeah, really. So you know, after after that first day of the first attack, everyone I was in shock. I can't speak for everyone, but I was definitely in shock. Saw mm-hmm. that. I remember seeing Winston Blake's body laying down in a room. Um, mm-hmm. His coat on. I mean, he'd been eating breakfast, and there were so many bullet holes that came from outside into the building. In front of his window was a, was a couple water tanks that were outside, but they're in front of his window. And I noticed that the window was shattered, and that water was pouring in from the from the water tank into the room. It was mixing with uh, his blood, and the water had been running down the hall a little bit. So when I got there, I saw that. I was like, my eyes were adjusting to the light a little bit. When I right. figured it out, I went and I looked at that water tank, and you could see that the bullet wound had come from the air, mm. the bullet hole in the tank. And because the tank was made out of plastic, you could see where the burrs came out. Uh, came, you could see where the bullet hole went in on the side of the tank and came out the other side of the tank. And then you could see little flakes of plastic around the outside edge indicating that it wasn't fired from the room outward. It was fired outward into the room. Yeah. So I said that was interesting. That's probably the bullet that killed him. Um, mm-hmm. ah, it's just weird when you see it, I guess. Well, anyway, so after that, I ended up in a room with a couple of friends of mine, Greg Summers. We were talking about Greg took care of the, the, the dogs and he was really upset at the fact that they came in and shot the dogs first thing. We were really mad about that. We were just pissed, really yeah. upset about it. And then, you know, you, Steve would be going up and down the hall, and as you would hear, as you would find people that would have been killed, you'd hear, Jadine Wendell's dead, Perry's wounded, mm-hmm. Peter Jen's dead. You know, you'd hear all these voices of people you knew that were no longer with us. It was, it was very powerful. It was very, it was, it was frightening. Right, yeah. What What goes through your mind during all this? I mean, did you think that, D- did you think, you know, David was right and this is, this is it. This is how we, we go. Then this is carrying out the prophecy. Then definitely. Wa- <laughs> yeah. I mean, he has been talking about it for a very long time that the government was going to attack that even though he would try to avoid it, it was unavoidable. So anyway, mm-hmm. so what happened here was very weird, but what was even weirder, I think was the next couple of days. There was a time about six months before that I was on a roof the day before doing some shingle work and he said what are you going to do Thibodeau when the tanks are running up and down double e ranch road here mm-hmm. and i said david that's never going to happen they're not going to bring tanks onto this property mm-hmm. and of course you know after the sea after the initial raid just about a, a day or two later there's tanks on the property 
Right. <laughs> and, you know, they, they, originally they're telling us stuff like the tanks will not move on the property. They're just going to be out the perimeter. Yeah. Uh, the double ranch road, they won't be coming onto your property. And literally that night, they start running over sheds and stuff on the outskirts of the property. Jeez. And we're calling and saying, hey, uh, I thought you guys said you weren't going to be bringing the tanks onto the property, but you just destroyed that shed in the far right hand corner of the property. And then they're saying, well, we, you know, we, we don't want any obstacles. We want to be able to see everything that's going on there. And we're like, well, that's a, on the right hand side of the property. And there's no, that's not an obstacle. You guys are right. just running it over. Just being dicks. So <laughs> they're basically lying to us from the first night on. Absolutely. They're basically telling us one thing and doing another. And that didn't stop. That went through the whole 51 day season. It was one thing. And that's covered, I think, fairly well in the series. Mm hmm. There's a lot more examples though that are just as outrageous. Yeah, they left out the the mooning. <laughs> yeah, the no, they showed the mooning. In the oh, did they? I must have missed that. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. yeah. They showed they showed grown men on the tanks mooning us. I know that was funny and giving right. us the finger. That did happen. There is a lot left out though because just for time. I mean, great. There's so much. For time, it, for if you really want to know what happened and what chronology, uh, I think reading my book the. Uh, a wake up survivor story is the best way. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that the documentary, the rules of engagement and a new revelation are very good documentaries to watch as well. Absolutely. When it comes to Waco and, and understanding what really happened, you're going to get, you know, more from it reading the book than you are from the series. But I, I think the series has done an excellent job. Right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking the series. I'm really happy with what they did and how they did it. Yeah, for sure. But there are some there are some inconsistencies though. Mm -hmm. In all of this, did I mean? I know we're kind of jumping around and glossing over some stuff. I know you're kind of pressed for time, so I don't want to keep it too long. But uh, yeah, did you? Good. Yeah, did you uh, ever see David's writing of the Seven Seals after that whole agreement? Uh, did you? You know, do you know if it was in fact being written? Yeah, he was working on it. Uh, you know the. When Tabor and Arnold, of course, we were listening to the Ron Engelman show every day, and he had uh, uh, Phil, Phil Arnold and James Tabor come on. These were two religious scholars, you know, from the academic world that were very interested in his tape, his original tape. And he didn't said that there actually is something there, and we would love to read the Seven Seals manuscript. They came out with the idea that if you were to write it down, the Seven Seals, the manuscript form, that I could get to James Tabor and Phil Arnold and, and, and the correct people would, would be, would now possess his manuscript. So it wouldn't die with him. And so David started writing it that night when, after we heard that, and he had finished the first seal on April 18th and he was starting the second seal. Mm -hmm. And then to, he even sent in typewriter ribbons so he could finish <laughs> the <laughs> night before. Yeah. And then, of course, on April 19th, they started the CS gas attack plan where they started putting in the fair rounds into the building and shooting uh, CS gas all through the building for the course of the day. Mm -hmm. I, I asked uh, Gary about the, the whole CS gas thing. Um, he, he said that he was, didn't think that there was anything illegal about that. Do you know? Uh, I, I've heard a lot of people in these documentaries say definitively, yes, it is illegal to use on uh, citizens. Or it's against the Geneva Convention, but he wasn't familiar with that. Can you speak to that? Sure. I'm familiar with it. <laughs> I thought you might there's be. Some, yeah, there's something. Uh, Gary is a very, he's a great communicator. He's a very interesting person. I didn't think that I would enjoy the company of someone that worked in the FBI for obvious reasons. Are all right. uh, but I actually did and do enjoy Gary's company and I think he's an interesting individual he's mm -hmm. extremely knowledgeable but I think when it comes to his organization that there's some things that he may not want to face and look sure. at and so it's much easier to believe something you want to believe than to really look into it I think that's the case here with Gary as sure. I always mention anyway I always mention the red it doesn't seem to want to see it so I, I don't I don't know there what's up but what I can tell you is that the Geneva Convention does not allow the use of CS gas internationally. So we couldn't go over and pick a fight with another country and use CS gas. However, there's no law in America saying we can't use it against our own citizens. Mm -hmm. and even in the, in the manufacturer's literature, it says 
CS gas is a riot control agent to only be used outdoors, never to be used in a building. Mm. Uh, a lot of that is because of the defined thin uh, particle. Uh, um, it's, the, it's the fact that it's thin, you know, very fine particles that make it flammable when it's put into a room. Mm -hmm. uh, more importantly, not that CS gas is any is particularly flammable, but the delivery system is methylene chloride, which is flammable. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very interesting. In the in the show, they mention a lot of cases where CS gas has been used in a building, and that building has ended up catching on fire. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very interesting. Um, I like the way they did that in in the series. It really hit home uh, for me. Sure. But you know, they use so much CS gas. I think a hundred. 200 and something ferret rounds, and then they ran ferret rounds. They had to get more. And they were, you know, mm -hmm. they were making holes in the building in very strategic areas. In the front, of course, on the side. You saw that the holes that were on the side of the building were made right where the hallways were that went all the way down to the other end of the building. And especially they had that, that boom that went up and got that made the hole in the second story right where the hallway was. Mm -hmm. We had several fire marshals that we wanted to testify on our behalf at the trials in San Antonio, and the judge would not allow any of our expert witnesses to testify. And I thought that was just outrageous. But our fire marshals also did the same thing, that the way the FBI was destroying the building and putting strategic holes places here, 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 and here made it like a fire flu. Uh, they put so much oxygen in that system that if a fire were to be introduced to those circumstances, it would go up very quickly. Right, uh, like a Roman candle base, I just go, up, you know, go up very fast. I thought that was extremely interesting and telling that the judge would not allow any of these people on. We know the fire trucks were stopped at the first checkpoint, and um, the the on scene commander Jeffrey Jamar would not allow the fire trucks to go and fight the fire. Mm -hmm. Of course, he said that he was worried about people. Oh, well, that's the other thing that really bothers me about the last day. They put all this gas into the building. And, you know, they had run over the phone line with tanks. So we didn't have any communication. And we were hoping to establish communication. And even though they're gas masks, we were going to try to hold out. Put our gas masks on, we'd open the windows, and sometimes the breeze would take the CS gas out. You know, it was bearable. Mm -hmm. uh, even over the course of six hours, what happened is I was listening to the radio, and it was, you know, it was a news report at 10.30. And the news report said that the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas, is, is uh, there's been a approved tear gas plan. The FBI are putting tear gas into the building in hopes that people come out. Right. No one. It went on to say the FBI has claimed that they've received over 200 gunshots against their CEVs, but due to the credit of the FBI, they have not fired back at the Davidian. I been there the whole morning while this is going on. Nobody fired at those tanks. I was absolutely shocked and stunned that they were saying that they had received over 200 gunshots. I'm oh. looking up and down the hall going, who fired? Who shot? Mm -hmm. No, I, mean, I, I was in the chapel area with quite a few people, and nobody had heard a shot all day. We were stunned that they were saying that. And that's when I lost hope, which is really, that's the worst thing that could happen to an individual. Of all the crappy experiences I've had in my life, I've always had hope, except mm -hmm. for that one. And that was probably the worst experience of my life, was when you get that sinking feeling that not even God can help you at this point. Right, yeah. Your hope is gone. At that point, the only hope was gone. The hope was totally gone. I knew that they were sending the American public up for a slaughter, and this is it. This is how this, it was going to take place. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was extremely, you know, like I said, it went on for another hour and a half. And then finally, someone yelled from upstairs. And I remember it was upstairs. I can't remember where, but you could tell it was a distant voice upstairs. There's a fire. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that, I went to the front. I, tried, I, was, I had tried earlier to get down the hallway uh, to where Serenity was and Michelle and some of the kids that were put into the uh, concrete structure. There was so much debris from the destruction of the building from the tanks coming through the front that they had totally blocked off the entranceway um, to the hallway, so you couldn't get there. You, you could not access the cafeteria from the, you know, from where I was, the chapel area. But right. I knew that there was there was a walkway, so you know I went 
behind the stage between the chapel area and the gymnasium area, there was a walkway, and that had a ladder that led upstairs to the, or it was a, I think it was a staircase that led upstairs to the, boy, sorry, I remember that so long ago, mm-hmm. uh, led upstairs to where the second story hallway was. Well, there was a catwalk over the, over the roof of the chapel area. And I walked over the catwalk to where the second story hallway was, the one that was facing the building. And there was a, a blanket that was over the doorway. And I remember I opened the blanket and the, this wall of flame shot down the hall in front of me. It was incredibly loud. It was really loud. Like, you know, the noise is unbelievable. I'll never forget that. And then, you know, it was this wall of flame that shot down the hallway all the way to the other end. It was crazy. I, I couldn't stick my head in there. Mm-hmm. I knew there was no end of that, that hallway, so I knew at that point that I would not be able to get to the cafeteria. So I came back downstairs, and by the time I did, I guess the fire was pretty much... I, I was in the, that area between the chapel and the, and the, and the, and the gymnasium. And so I'm sitting there, you know, and it's like, and there's a lot of smoke. I'm trying to get low. There's a big hole from the tanks that made in the wall, but I, I didn't want to go up there. I figured I would be shot for sure if I were to exit that building. Right. And I think why well, a lot of people cut away in the last minute. All of a sudden, Derek Lovelock went out, Jamie Casile went out. And when that when Jamie went out, what happened was the wall that I was leaning against started to catch fire, and I could hear my hair crackling from the fire. And that, that's kind of, I said, okay, whatever. I, I'm going to be shot. I'm going to be shot. I'm not going to burn to death. I'd rather be shot. So I followed right. Jamie. I didn't think anyone could make it out behind me. But I was walking toward the Red Cross sign. There was a Red Cross sign, and the, the speaker systems were telling me to walk toward the Red Cross sign. So you uh, you went out, and you, you're basically committing suicide. You thought, this is it. This is how I die. I'm going to go do it. And Yeah. yeah. I, well, yeah, I'd much rather have been shot than to have burned enough. That right, right. Sure. That was the justification. Absolutely. I was... There was no one more surprised than me when I wasn't shot and I was still walking toward that red cross. Right. I, was, I mean, I was a little overwhelmed because I, I just thought for sure it was, this was it. Mm-hmm. I was definitely surprised that I had survived. I turned around and I looked, I saw Clive Doyle coming out and he was patting his arms out. That was kind of a disgusting sight. So I turned back around. Everything went into tunnel vision at this point. It was really, really weird. It's like mm-hmm. everything was black except for this this one round, one foot in diameter circle in front of me that I could see through. Mm-hmm. It was just like being in a movie. It was so weird. I got about halfway down the property and I turned around just in time to see the tower blow up. And when that happened, I could feel the heat from it hit me. It was a phenomenal force. It was just incredible. Turned back around. I got to that red cross sign. There was a tank there. Two, two FBI agents, they put us on, put me on my face, and they put a strap, plastic strap on my hand, and they were asking me where the kids were. You have to live with us for the rest of your life. They said, where are the women and children? I said, they should be in the underground bus. Right. You guys love the underground bus. And the one guy looked at the other guy and said, we tear gas that bus. Not only Jeez. did they tear gas the bus, but they also blocked off the entrance to the bus, which would have been the safest place for the kids. Mm-hmm. They blocked off that entrance by one of the tanks going in, and destroying the wall right over where the entrance was. So there was and they're trying to make you feel guilty for all this happening. Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, lovely. The one said, "I knew this wasn't going to work. We should have gone with Plan B." And then he said, "The one after that, the one guy said they start. You think they started that fire?" He said to the other guy. And the guy with the one guy had a gun. One guy had a notepad. There was right information down. And the guy with the gun said. You're damn right they started that fire. There was not one pyrotechnic in that building. I'll never forget him saying that. Mm. So it indicated to me a couple things. Some of the guys on the ground had no idea what was really going on. I think mm. it was only a few that really knew what was going on. I don't think that all the FBI agents are terrible, evil people. No, I do not. Sure. Um, I believe that as an organization, they made some incredibly wrong steps there. Mm-hmm. I think God differently. <laughs> I think it was really sinister how they held the fire trucks back, how they wouldn't allow family voices to intervene. There's so much that one person controlled, Jeffrey Jamar, that made it the tragedy that it was. You know, I mean, I don't know, it's just an awesome thing that with more people should have been held accountable right. than were. Absolutely. 
So, you know, anyway, for, for what it's worth, I was fine. I mean, I went on, on about my life after everything. Uh, I read the autopsy reports, 13 people had bullet wounds in the center of their head, the center of the chest. That always bothered me because I didn't recall hearing any gunshots when I, you know, uh, during the fire. Mm-hmm. But like, the fire was very, very loud. So I went my life just thinking, okay, you know, I didn't really know how the fire began. I, I didn't think anyone inside started the fire, certainly. I never believed that. But I didn't know. You know, they claimed that the pirate, that there was no pyrotechnics in the building. Mm-hmm. Seeing the FBI, I think there's no pyrotechnics in the building. You know, these are powerful things to witness. Right. But then I even started talking about it. I went all over the country giving talks. Some people said I was a government agent. That's why I wasn't in jail. It's just ridiculous. Some of these people were so ridiculous out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I dealt with all that. It's like, whatever. Yeah, I'm a government agent. Okay, whatever. I, that's a big <laughs> bottom. Right. I just I have the damn thing. So that makes me a government agent. Who the hell do you people think? Anyway, I'm getting lost the track. Sorry. No, I get a little right. emotional when I start talking about this. You know, I mean, uh, Absolutely. Go through all that and have agent provocateurs call you, of all things, government agent. It is right. Disgusting. It uh, really is. Uh, discrediting you anyway, for after all yeah. the crap that you've gone through. So whatever. Then the, the trials, they were ridiculous. But before mm-hmm. all that, what happened was there was a guy named William Gazeki, Mike, uh, uh, Mike Moore, William Gazeki, someone else said, damn, I'm forgetting someone, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, sorry. Yeah, Nelson, I think. And they, mm-hmm. these, these three individuals put this documentary together, uh, Waco, The Rules of Engagement. And I was invited to come see the infrared video. And I'm like, what infrared? What's the infrared video? And they said, well, the FBI had a plane flying above the building on the last day about two miles up. It had an infrared camera. And what the infrared camera does is it shows you places where heat signatures show up as white mm-hmm. and places where it's cool show up as dark. And they said, this is what, we have this infrared video and you need to see what's on it. And I said, okay. And they showed me where the tank was at the back of the building destroying the gym. And the gym was going out. I could see that. And then you could see two flashes in the area where the gym was. And right. I was like, wow. Because they were bright flashes. It looked like a pyrotechnic device. Mm-hmm. Of course, they had found two or three different pyrotechnic devices separate from from the ferret rounds. Mm-hmm. In the aftermath, which I was kind of blown with, blown away with. So then what happened was I saw this infrared video and I saw these pyrotechnic what looked like explosions. And then near the tanks, as the building was burning, going toward the cafeteria area, I could see flash, 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 flash really bright light. Mm-hmm. I mean, white hot on the infrared. And they were fully automatic weapons fire. And they compared it to a similar infrared video taken in Somalia with troops coming out of the helicopter. And you could see the exact same flash, flash, flash. When they counted them up, it was about 98 flashes in total. So two different shooters next to two different tanks shot into that building over 90, about 90, 95 times or so. What were they shooting at? If that's, and here's where I'm going to finish my point. Recently, there was a documentary on A&E about Waco, and it was actually pretty good. It was way more thorough than I thought it would be, and it seemed to be very fair until the end. When they said, well, it was a mass suicide, and then they right. showed the FBI guy saying, yes, it was a mass suicide. What I want to know is nine people survived. that came out of that fire. None of them brought out children. Why didn't any of them bring out children? One of them even brought out a dog, but no children. And I was so angry when I saw that and this is recent I'm yeah. like after all these years you guys are still going to pull that crap right. it's hard to bring up kids if you're being shot down as you're trying to exit the building when you have when you have autopsy reports to the center of your head and the center of your chest bullet wounds that's how you're dying you can't bring kids out if you're being shot at so you, right. FBI you can't say that people should have brought out kids while you're shooting them down, and it can be proven that you're shooting them down. And right. all they did was cover up. They covered up this infrared. They did some kind of special thing in the middle of nowhere. Uh, some 
where they prove that these are sunlight reflections. That's BS. Those aren't friggin' sunlight reflections. And a 13 year old boy can tell you that's fully automatic weapons fire on that infrared. And they still cover it up. They still refuse to acknowledge the fact that they murdered people at Mount Carmel on April 19, 1996. They will not admit it. They will not apologize. Those survivors and people that are my friends that are screwed in the past 25 years by this government who mm-hmm. called us murderers, they call us child molesters and all these things, and they murdered all those people. And you know what? They still rewrite history. And people in this country accept it. You see, that shouldn't be acceptable. Right. That shouldn't be acceptable. It's, we are we are in a technological age. And if the facts can be presented as facts, well, that's what they are, they're facts. And I don't care if you're the government or the president, you have no right to get away with that crap. And that's what we've been living with for 25 years. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And, on. and they just continue to screw the American people over. Preach. And that's my story. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sick of it. I'm, yeah. I'm sick of the lying. I'm sick of the covering up. I mean, and it's not just wake up. I mean, there's, JFK, there's so many things that people want to know the truth to. Mm-hmm. Massive sequence of they holy. There's so many secrets they won't tell us. Absolutely. I'm sorry, they don't have the right to judge us and kill us as well as lie to us. No, there's got to be a point where these people in Congress they all need to go, and we need to get back to a, a, a more a form of government that's more constitutional than it is now. These people that allow all this to happen are just they shouldn't have their jobs. That's all. They, they <laughs> shouldn't. I can't. They, they're still in power right i agree with you 100 percent um yeah it's definitely an abuse and they i mean they point fingers at david koresh for abusing his power and manipulating people while they are yeah. carrying out crap like this so thanks for your time but i'm really gonna go now so i'm gonna pass my time already and I get sure it. do you want to plug your book your show all that um you can do that for me can do <laughs> will do well yeah, man. Oh, yeah, I, I have a book. It's a survivor story, and I think it's pretty good. I was pretty honest in it. I was honest to a fault, actually. It's kind of embarrassing to myself how honest I was in this book, but nonetheless, sure. I, I felt that had to, you know, I had to talk about everything. Um, mm-hmm. Someone had to, someone had to be honest. <laughs> right. Get it from your government. I can tell you that. Anyway, I really got to run, buddy. I'm sorry. No problem, man. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening and sticking around to the end. I I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and hopefully you learned something in the process. As I said at the beginning of the show, uh, The System is Down is doing a drawing for a chance to win a free DVD copy of Star Wars The Last Jedi. I'll be doing the drawing and announcing the winner on next Monday's episode, so you'll want to get signed up as soon as possible and make sure you tune into that episode. Uh, There are three ways that you can enter to win. The first is by joining the Downers Club, which is our patron program that helps us keep the show running, helps keep the lights on, helps keep us growing and having bigger and better guests like Gary Nesner and David Thibodeau and so forth. Um, Members of the club also receive multiple episodes of the show every single week. They get our giant backlog of bonus episodes and much, much more. So you can sign up for that by going to tsidpod.com forward slash support. The second way to enter this drawing for The Last Jedi is just by going over to iTunes and leaving us a happy review with all the stars that you can possibly leave. Post a screenshot of your review and the system is down, and that will give you another chance to win. You can find the forum by going to tsidpod.com forward slash forum. It's free to enter. You'll love it. It's a great place. Uh, The third and final way to enter is simply by going to tsidpod.com and giving a one-time donation of $5 or more to the show. All these ways, all all these things are extremely helpful in growing and building credibility for the show. And if you do, you could potentially win a free copy of The Last Jedi on DVD. So you've got nothing to lose. You can sign up in all three ways if you want to be entered three times and have a better shot of winning. So check that out. TSIDpod.com forward slash support. TSIDpod.com forward slash forum. Make it happen. I also have to give a shout out to our latest member to join the Downers Club, Keaton Johnson. Thank you so much for your support. 
And seriously, thank you guys, all of you who support the show financially, and even those of you who just tune in every week to listen to the show for free. Uh, you guys are awesome. You're helping get the word out. You're sharing it. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Please keep it up. You guys are great. Uh, together, we're building this awesome community of people who can talk to each other, have uncomfortable conversations, uh, have disagreements, maybe even get a little politically incorrect from time to time, but do so without being rude, disrespectful, or name-calling or anything like that. Basically, Facebook without all the things that you think about when you hear the words Facebook. No, no shouting each other down. We're just talking and hearing each other out. It's, it's fantastic. It's, it's clearly something that our culture is practically devoid of today. So let's keep changing that together. Let's keep changing the world. Go out, go forth, and share the show with one person this week. Invite someone new into the forum, tsidpod.com forward slash forum. Uh, like, subscribe, share the show on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all that stuff, uh, wherever else you conduct social media business. And, you know, let's let's keep this going. Let's make this a movement. Um, let's make a movement of humans being humans and treating each other, you guessed it, like humans. Crazy. Crazy, right? I'd say it's not a lot to ask, so <laughs> please do all that, and I will, of course, be back here first thing next Monday morning with some more uncomfortable conversations for you. Until then, question everything and stay uncomfortable. Thanks. This has been a Goulash Media production. Goulashmedia.net. This concludes our broadcast day. Click. Click.